Welcome to Points of View with San Francisco Ballet. This episode will explore San Francisco Ballet's production of Cinderella, choreographed by Christopher Wilden to Prokofiev's beautiful score, and runs from March 31st through April 8th. Cinderella had its U.S. premiere in 2013 and is a co-production of San Francisco Ballet and Dutch National Ballet. In this production, Christopher Wilden transforms the timeless tale of Cinderella with stunning choreography, charming character twists, captivating puppetry, and mesmerizing visual effects. While there's no fairy godmother in this version, there are plenty of whimsical dancing by birds, seasons, and the four fates that sweep Cinderella off her feet into a carriage and off to the ball. This is a fairy tale for our time. This Points of View will be moderated by Jessica Cohen. Jessica trained at the San Francisco Ballet School and was a San Francisco Ballet School trainee before she danced professionally with Northern Ballet and the Sarasota Ballet, and then transitioned to Broadway stages and joined the first national tour of An American in Paris, which was directed and choreographed by Christopher Wielden. In 2021, she co-founded Artists Becoming and the Artists Becoming podcast, which features many San Francisco ballet dancers and choreographers in conversation about their artistic journeys. And now I'm thrilled to welcome our two guests, principal dancers Misa Kuranaga and Isaac Hernandez. While both Misa and Isaac have previously performed the roles of Cinderella and the Prince in Wilden's production, this will be their first time dancing these roles together. So now let's hear their points of view. I'm delighted to be here today for Points of View on Cinderella, choreographed by Christopher Wielden, ahead of its upcoming performances here at the San Francisco Ballet. Wielden Cinderella is a co-production of the San Francisco Ballet and Dutch National Ballet. It had its U.S. premiere in 2013 in San Francisco, and the timeless story of Cinderella is set to the music of composer Sergei Prokofiev. Wheeled in enriches and transforms the story of Cinderella with stunning style, charming twists, and a mesmerizing visual effects. I'm excited to be here today with two of the stars you will see on stage in the upcoming run of the production, Misa Kuranaga and Isaac Hernandez, who will be performing on opening night, Friday, March 31st. Um, Misa and Isaac, thank you so much for, for joining me today. Thank you. Pleasure to be here. Awesome. Um, Misa was born in Japan and trained in Japan as well as at the School of American Ballet. She joined the San Francisco Ballet as an apprentice in 2001 and danced at the Boston Ballet where she rose through the ranks to becoming a principal dancer. She returned to SFB in 2019 as a principal. Um, and has danced a, a full breadth of works from contemporary to classical choreographers. I think I would lose um, my vocal cords trying to, to list them all <laughs> in, this, in this particular conversation. Um, Isaac was born in Mexico and received private training under his father before going to train at the Rock School for Dance Education. He joined San Francisco Ballet in 2008, was promoted to soloist in 2011, and crossed the pond over to Dutch National Ballet and English National Ballet before returning to the company as a principal in 2022. So yay for you both. It's, it's very... Um, cool to see your tangential journeys of starting here and having this um, return to the company. Um, Misa has debuted the role of Cinderella in Wielden's production with San Francisco Ballet previously, and so has Isaac with the English National Ballet as Prince Guillaume um, in the round, I believe. So this season, they will be paired together as partners in their respective roles for the first time. Um, I'm very excited to dive into this conversation with you both about your experience, your roles, your artistic journeys. So um, to dive into that, Misa, I would love for you to tell me a little bit about perhaps that first spark um, of your artistic journey that inspired you to become a dancer and perhaps walk me through what led you to this point in your career today. Well, you um, <laughs> you talked to my, you talked to, you talked to everyone about my um, career mostly. So I'm just going to say personal feelings of how I got here. Um, 
well, I was really active as a child and my mom didn't know what to do about my energy. So she knew that she had to put me into something to get the energy out. And um, she thought that figure skating or rhythm gymnastics is a good thing. And we looked for something close to our house and we couldn't find anything. And I wanted to do ballet because my friends are taking ballet classes and my mom, for some reason, she didn't want me to become a dancer. So she said, absolutely not. So you're gonna just now do maybe take English course and uh, maybe nothing else. And then I saw a classical ballet um, school in front of my English classes. So I asked my mom to sign me up and she said no. And then I just was so stubborn that I didn't move from there and she just lost it and, <laughs> and she had to sign me up. That's, that's my beginning of my career. <laughs> and then from there, I um, quickly started training for becoming a professional dancer with my ballet teacher that I had in Japan. And started doing a lot of competitions in Japan and then finally like international competitions. And uh, in 2001, I did Pretty Lausanne. That's how I got to San Francisco Ballet as an apprentice. And um, I did not get my core contract after 10 months of my apprenticeship. So I went on to study more. So that's how I got to School of American Ballet. And then after that, I joined Boston Ballet for 16 years, got tons of experience, and then, then I got to come back here. Mm -hmm. so, wow. We met in one of those competitions, no? In Jackson, you were not in Jackson? Oh, yes. Yeah. 2006, we were in yeah. Jackson remember. competition. I was in senior, you were in junior. Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> that was a long time. Yeah. That was a great year, though, yeah, of competition. Mm -hmm. So many great dancers in 2006, mm -hmm. Jackson. Yeah. Wow, that's amazing. It's also very inspiring to hear how, uh, you know, you navigated a challenge of perhaps not originally being offered that full contract and you came back as a principal dancer that shows such, um, just such, such a beautiful example of like resilience and how you nourished your career and focused on your growth. That's a beautiful story. Um, Isaac or Isaac, will you please, you know, share what that first spark was for you and perhaps mirror what, what led you here today? Well, it started with my father, which was a dancer. My mom was a dancer as well. They had uh, 11 children, I'm number seven of 11. And uh, obviously they had, the, they didn't have many financial possibilities. So uh, most of the activities that we would do, we would do at home. We had a martial arts teacher that would come and train us. Uh, my dad set up a bar in the backyard of the house um, where we used to take class with all my siblings. Um, a piano tutor would come and would teach us on piano. Um, and we were homeschooled as well. So we grew up in a very different environment. And uh, my dad never really wanted us to be professional ballet dancers. He had had a very rough experience in that world. He had started dancing late. Uh, he had moved to New York. He had uh, really had a hard time in, in the profession. And, um, so that was not his intention. His intention was for us to have a physical activity that he knew would be beneficial for anything else that we would want to do. I wanted to be uh, a competitor professionally in martial arts. I was in Taekwondo and, and I really loved that side of things. And my dad thought ballet would complement it really well. And it did, but then soon enough, I fell in love with the art form and I enjoyed the time with my dad so much. And little by little, all my siblings started picking up different hobbies or different professions and I remained. Uh, we used to do three, four hour long bar, only bar because we could only do bar in, in that part of the backyard. And then my brother Esteban joined us and uh, some of my father's previous students from many years ago, decided to put together some money for my dad to rebuild a part of the house and turn it into a ballet studio. And that literally was what made my life as a professional dancer possible because I was able to then go into center and to start doing competitions. And I started winning all the competitions. And then my dad said, well, is this something that you want to do? If, if so, you have to 
uh, leave Mexico because we don't have the structure here in Mexico to have a decent professional career. Um, so he took me to New York to one of these Dance Educators of America competition that it was a complete accident for me to land there. Uh, but there I met the, uh, a teacher called Raymond Lukens, that uh, his husband was uh, Franco De Vita, and they were running uh, JKO, American Ballet School, uh, and they invited me to come to the summers, and I kept that relationship for eight years. I spent every summer at ADT, then I eventually joined the studio company, um, and it was uh, life-changing for me, uh, ballet, and I was lucky enough that I had it at home, uh, and then professional decisions came along and, uh, and like, like you were saying, I started my career here in San Francisco. Um, and, but I had the curiosity, I wanted to know what it was like to work in Europe and with some of the European companies and the repertoire is different, the, even the daily routine is different and the way that you prepare for uh, a role is different. And I always wanted to do that. I had a scholarship for the Royal Ballet School and I didn't get on the plane. Uh, so I always had that in the back of my head, and that's how I ended up in London and living all these experiences. Wow. <laughs> it's very cool to hear how many actually reflections you share in your career is that you both spoke to your parents having some resistance towards you following this mm -hmm. path, how competitions played pivotal roles in placing you in these schools and companies and um, returning to the company. So I love to hear about uh, those shared experiences. And to talk a bit about Cinderella, um, Isaac, you just mentioned the approach to a role that you were curious about ending up in London for that reason, how perhaps they approach things differently. And so I'm curious how you're approaching your roles as Cinderella and Prince Guillaume in this production. I'd love to hear from both of you um, a bit about your character and then what is your process for embodying that role, for embodying the role of Cinderella and perhaps how might that differ from what audiences know of those characters, per perhaps giving some nuance. Well, first, first of all, we had, um, we had about like five hours photo up to today. <laughs> Oh, because um, uh, we didn't have much time together in uh, fall when we were rehearsing Cinderella briefly. And um, we started back again, but now we are fully performing on stage. We can't have too many hours. Right. And so um, we're just trying to find uh, energy and um, best way to work together with each other and our coach Felipe. Um, so that's that's what's happening right now. Yeah. Well, I feel like I, I was in a unique position with this production because when this production was happening for the first time, I had just left San Francisco and gone to Dutch National Ballet. And then six months later, a group of dancers from San Francisco arrived to Dutch National Ballet to choreograph, mm -hmm. to, to be part of the choreographic process because half of the choreography was done here and half there. Um, so I had Masha and Joanne there, Francis came, and it was a quite, quite a nice experience. I had worked a lot with Chris before uh, here in the company, um, and there I was doing the role of Benjamin, and I was uh, learning the prints as well. So I was in it from the beginning, and then it was premiered, it was performed at Dutch National Ballet, and then when I moved to London, I got a different version at the Royal After Hall, which was one of the most... Uh, uh, beautiful experiences on a stage I've ever had. That stage is it's unforgettable. And what I found interesting about these roles is that it's obviously a very well-known fairy tale, Cinderella. It's the story is quite straightforward. There are no big surprises into it. But like you were saying earlier on, Chris is an incredibly clever choreographer in storytelling. Um, his team of designers are amazing, and they usually are amazing support for a production and for the storytelling itself. So you really have to trust that what's happening around you in the, in the production sense is enough for you to be able to convey whatever you are trying to say, choreographically speaking. And that takes a while. I feel like the, one of the benefits of having worked in the States and then gone to Europe is that there are different ways to portray classical ballet on a stage. Uh, I felt like 
in Amsterdam was similar to, to San Francisco, that it is quite um, uh, explicit. Uh, when you when you perform a gesture, you really go for it. Um, and then when I did it in London, it was much more subtle and it was more theatrical aspect of things. And I feel like right now, Chris, having worked on Broadway and having done uh, choreography for film and uh, with all the things, the projects that he's been building, he's a little bit leaning more towards the theatrical side of things. And I really appreciate that about this production, that you have the ability of going on to the role and performing it as a standard charming prince, prince charming of a fairy tale, where there is room for it to be a bit more caricaturistic, uh, kind of flamboyant, if you want, at times. Or you can try also to make it more relatable to a young guy, a modern day prince, that he doesn't want to do what he's told. Uh, and he has a will of his own, and he has a huge responsibility behind his, uh, his shoulders. Um, but he is, at the end of the day, a young guy trying to find his way in life. And I really like that approach. And, and I feel like the first time I experienced this role, I was not mature enough to understand that. And now, after my experience in England, I feel like that's what attracts me the most about these kind of roles. Even though they are very well-known fairy tales, they are a lot of there's a lot of room there uh, with Chris for it to be uh, more humane, to be more realistic, uh, for the connection between Cinderella and the prince to be as real as possible. And at the end of the day, we all have this idea in the back of the head of uh, what would it be like to be a prince and a princess. And, you know, like we grow up with these ideas of, of princes and, and I feel like we are in a unique position to interpret our own version every show that we get on the stage so that's really exciting mm, yeah i love that you spoke to um chris wielden's experience um choreographing now not just for classical ballet but on broadway i had the opportunity to dance in an american in paris with him and i know how you know deeply passionate he is about the characters and how the movement informs the characters. Um, I feel like Chris's choreography, for some reason, I always think about the footwork and the articulation and, you know, how important that is to him and how much mm -hmm. that that can add to the storytelling. So I'm curious, working with Chris, you know, what has been some of your personal experiences working with him as a choreographer and in relation to Cinderella, um, you know, Misa, perhaps, how how does the choreography inform the character of Cinderella or what is particularly unique about Cinderella in this production? So um, previously I have danced um, version of Ashton and that's much more of a um, traditional version with yeah. classical tutu and then very classically um, choreographed. And, um, but Chris's version is more neoclassical and uh, a little bit more free, and I really like that. And um, I only got to work with Chris for like a couple of days when he was here in Nepal. And um, what I really liked about what he said about Cinderella's character is that, you know, usually people think that, oh, she's just like a frightened little girl and then she gets lucky to be married to Prince at the end, but he um, described Cinderella as she has this huge inner strength in herself already um, from the beginning. And uh, she just believes in herself. This is why she gets to be where she is at the end. So I really like that interpretation. And then I think this time around, um, I, I wanna think about that more. Um, building my character towards the shows. And um, uh, I think that's about it. Mm -hmm. yeah. you, you said it really well as well when, when you were talking about the, the sort of physicality that Chris has used. Um, I feel like one of the hardest things for me to learn as a principal dancer was to trust the choreography. 
because you feel like once you know the steps, then you need to put a lot more into it for it to really convey the meaning that you're trying. And, and we are in front of a, one of the most accomplished, incredible choreographers of our generation. He knows exactly what he's doing and what he wants out of each step. Mm -hmm. So when you trust that, then the, the storytelling comes more natural. I think that um, you do have to be making artistic choices in every show because there is room for that in his choreography. Um, but I feel like if you do the choreography as he intended, then the artistic choices might feel the most natural thing to do on yeah. stage. And that's something that I really like about his work in Fulham. Yeah, yeah, that, I, that resonates with me. I think sometimes it's just in one little motif of steps that there's an entire sentence, you know, you yeah. don't have to create the sentence. It's almost like yeah, it's already there. So I think that that's really powerful. Um, I'm curious to talk a bit about your partnership. I know you, Misa, you said you're five hours into the rehearsal process. So, um, you know, I'm curious, perhaps you can speak about it, you know, outside looking in versus to actually what's happening currently and as you're developing your partnership. But how would you describe like what makes a strong partnership? Um, I think partnering is very nuanced and dancers are masters of, you know, nonverbal communication, but how do you create a strong partnership and what does that look like in your process preparing for the show? Talking about like how we had five hours and um, uh, <laughs> we're still building that now, but um, because we both had experiences, um, as dancers and also have done Chris's versions of Cin version of Cinderella before, that helps too. Um, this is why it's possible, even though we only have a little time to put everything together. Um, but about partnership, I feel like chemistry is really, really important. And, um, and then that's something either you have it naturally or not. And then when you find that kind of um, chemistry, just when you feel it, it's it's an instant thing. And of course, you still have to work together. And if you, of course, you have to rehearse. And you can't just like not rehearse and go on stage and then hope that everything's going to go well. But um, when you have that, that's kind of like, oh my gosh, I feel lucky. And then I do feel lucky um, this time around to be able to dance Cinderella with Isaac. And um, yes, we really haven't rehearsed that much, mm -hmm. seriously. Mm -hmm. But I, I, I have this huge trust because I just do feel this um, instant trust between our um, technical part and then the artistic part too. So um, that, that's me. Yeah, I think it's interesting because obviously we are very uh experienced dancers um but for me i think it has to do with the ability of being present on a stage mm -hmm. uh, when you start a choreography is a conversation so for me it's, it's really interesting when you catch each other's eyes on a stage and when you can see that for the other person nothing else exists for that moment that it is simply between you and her um, then I know that everything will be okay. That even if some steps don't work out, that we are going to be able to tell the story because we are literally living the story in front of all these people. Um, and that's a very rare capacity to have as a, as a dancer because it's not only the training, it's not only the ability to do the technical steps, it's not only the ability to be able to be a good actor, but it's also the ability to control all the variants around the moment, which is nerves, which is insecurities, your mind, the noise that you might feel at the moment, and quiet it all down to be able to be present and to be able to react and have a conversation through such a physicality. It's a really unique thing to accomplish. And I feel like when that happens, that's a strong partnership. Um, and I feel like uh, like we are able to accomplish that because 
Like I said, we have a, a, the background to do it. We've danced a couple of times mm -hmm. together before. Um, and it's always been very easy to live the moment. So that's what I'm after, really. It's to be able to have the trust and also the ability to be present in every scene and just simply have a dance together. Because at the end of the day, that's what Cinderella and the Prince are trying to do, just connect through this amazing language that that we are experts in and um, and that we get the fortune to try every day so I think that that's the most important thing in partnership for me yeah yeah I, to bridge those together it's having that trust and then the trust in your expertise to be present enough mm -hmm. for the alchemy of your chemistry to come to life um on my last uh, meet the artist interview I did it before one of the performances of Giselle, an audience member asked, you know, how do you, how do you find the chemistry? Do you pick each other as partners? Mm -hmm. And, you know, the answer was no, like, the, the direct, <laughs> you know, yeah. it's, it's interesting. It's not as though you all go on dates and decide who gets to dance what with each other, you know, it's, it's that it's decided for you. And so I think that that's really um, valuable insight that it's sort of like your expertise comes together to create the chemistry. Yeah. I mean, what I really love about that is that when you become a principal dancer, literally part of your job description is to have that ability yeah. and to be able to have the capacity to make artistic choices all the time. Mm -hmm. Like throughout the show that is two and a half hours, the amount of artistic choices that you have to make with your partner or by yourself, it can be infinite. Mm -hmm. um, so I feel like when you work for a company like San Francisco Ballet, uh, and you have such a range of talent, then it, it's, it must be also fun to be able to pair people and, and see what comes out of these creative minds that are constantly coming alive on a stage and making all these artistic choices based on their experience, their personal experience, their professional. So I, I do really feel lucky to be able to dance with different ballerinas and to be able to connect in such a personal way as well because at the end of the day that's that's our job we get to expose ourselves in a very emotional way on a stage and the receiving end of it uh, it's your partner it's your dance colleague yeah yeah it's all these different ingredients you know that make up the company and the directors get to put you know the two different ingredients and change it and see what comes that's, that's and really absolutely. like the end result is just for the audience to enjoy, yeah. you know, and it, it changes every time that you are on a stage. So each performance is unique to the audience that it's seen. And, yeah. and that's almost addictive to me. <laughs> yeah. And I um I want to touch as well on something um in relation to me. So what you mentioned about, you know, you've had five hours at this point because you're currently on stage in uh a mixed rap program. You had the next at 90 festival with nine new works. You're coming off of Giselle. Um, so I'd love to know how you navigate, you know, how do you navigate that uh, as principal dancers across one season, having that capacity to be able to transform from the neoclassical to the classical and everything in between. Um, how do you take care of yourselves? How do you approach the season in that way? I'd love to hear each of your approaches. Well, I'm still getting used to San Francisco Ballet's schedule. <laughs> um, our schedule is very tight and intense because we don't stop performing from January to May. And um, we're constantly on stage almost every night um, since January. So um, every little time that we have, uh, of course, I'm not the scheduling person and they will schedule everything for you. But on top of that, to do that one hour of rehearsal scheduled in your daily schedule, you might have to do homework at home, um, watching video to get ready and so that you don't cause a problem in your rehearsal. So um, yes, in between shows, I'm constantly watching, right now I'm watching Cinderella videos just to see like, okay, what's the next section? Oh, did I forget this? Did I forget that? Uh, I need to remember this and then, okay, like what's 
what um, what's our next rehearsal is going to be, and all that. So um, it's a constant um, <laughs> uh, work that you have to put in. I think I was lucky because I had experienced the company before for four years. I knew the scheduling. I I did forget a little bit how hard it was because. It was a bit of a shock. I knew this season was going to be hard physically because it's all packed and you spend so much time rehearsing different ballads. And um, I have been really lucky this season. Um, and also I feel like uh, Tamara has been really good at uh, dividing responsibilities mm -hmm. amongst the principals, especially mm -hmm. um, this year, this season, I didn't do Giselle, for example. I had a break during that time. It was helpful for different reasons, but the body also really appreciated that. And, and I feel like back uh, 10 years ago when I was in the company, I felt overwhelmed by the volume of work that whenever I had a day off, I didn't want to take a day off. And I felt like it happened to a lot of dancers that were young at the time. And that would push you to injure yourself before even making it to the season. Um, so now with, with the experience that I have, I realize that whenever you have a day off, you take a day off. And if you have a program off, then you use that time to get your physical therapy, to get alternative strengthening solutions, or to really look after yourself for when the responsibility comes uh, for, you to, for you to be ready. Um, I think it is a very unique scheduling. Um, most companies I've worked for, their season goes throughout the whole year. Um, but it is exciting. It, it feels kind of like a mountain to climb mm -hmm. and you feel incredibly accomplished. We did almost every show of the Next at 90 program. And I felt like the, really, the energy of all the company is required in order to make it. And there's a sense of solidarity and you are always kind of cheering for each other and stepping in for people and uh, or maybe just helping them out in a rehearsal so that they can look after themselves uh, and, and make the shows. So I feel like that creates a very unique atmosphere and it also pushes dancers to, to really become an, an amazing performing machine and that <laughs> doesn't happen in many other companies. <laughs> Machine. Yeah. <laughs> well yeah, I mean, it's astonishing. I, 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 I bow down to you both for, for the way that you're able to accomplish what you do. It's so incredible. Um, on that note, I'm curious, do you have any pre-show rituals or how do you prepare yourself to be in the right state of mind before a performance? I think we both get ready for the show really early. Mm -hmm. I, I remember you talking about that. Yeah. 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 That's not. I've been looking for something that kind of works all the time, and um, and it's hard. I feel like it's something that performers do everywhere, like singers and uh, actors, and all of it. We are constantly looking for what makes the ultimate show experience for us, and and it's so frustrating because sometimes you show up late and you're running like you're rushing yourself, and you show up on the stage. And all of a sudden, you have an amazing show. <laughs> and then you're like, oh, come on. You know, I've been spending all this time trying to find out the ideal situation yeah. for me to perform at my best. I think what I realize now is that the most important thing is to be able to bring in your mental focus as tightly together as possible before the show. Because when once you are in that situation, then you can react to anything that comes at you once the performance starts. I feel like if your mind is scattered uh, when you start the performance, then things, when they go wrong, that most performances have things that go wrong, then you are not able to respond in the most agile and total objective kind of way. Um, so I just try to find good music that puts me in the right mood. Um, yesterday, I went back to my teenage years and maybe it was not a good idea. Uh, but but it just depends also on the role, and I think that's that's the only thing that I really look out for is the kind of music that I yeah. that I listen to really sets up my mind and my mood for the rest of the of the show. I'm probably the opposite. What I need from myself before the show is to find center physically, and 
so like a lot of time I'm just doing like I'm I have to do full bar before and then mostly I'm balancing it's not like well of course I have to activate my feet and legs and things but I really need to find my center so even if I my mind is not at the right place I could still not be physically apart and that's something that I have to do um I have to find my center so I can balance I can stand on my own <laughs> yeah that's so interesting that's good it makes you a good partner be- partnership because Misa you've got your physical center <laughs> Isaac you've got your <laughs> mental center <laughs> and together your whole yeah um that's great I I know that many dancers or artists have have their ways that they sort of get in the zone. Um, uh, beautiful. Well, to close, I think just for one fun question, um, two fun questions. What are you most looking forward to for the rest of the season to perform? And then the second one is what's your favorite genre of music to, to kind of stem off of Isaac, what you just said about music. What's your favorite genre of music when you're not dancing on stage? I don't have well <laughs> yeah I don't think I also I, I don't think I have one in particularly I have mood swings musical mood swings all the time um, I really love classical music uh, I, I fell in love uh, a few months back with a violinist called Bomsori she's Korean and she has the most beautiful Thais meditation I, I've heard also like a really beautiful Nutcracker Padabe version that she's made so I've been listening a lot to that because it just gives me room to relax and just to really listen to the possibilities there in the music and, and the capacity to create such beauty with strings, you know? Um, but I also love techno music. I sometimes put even Maluma and uh, some reggaeton. And uh, I have some friends that sometimes send me music. Um, that uh, that is not very well known and usually my fallback whenever I want to sort of recognize myself again in a musical sense I go back to Etta James I really love um, uh, Cook um, another Saturday night I forget his name um, <laughs> anyway um, uh, I like jazz so in that sense that kind of brings me back to to my comfortable place uh, in, in the music set. Love that. And what about uh, for the rest of the season? What are you excited to perform? Well, I really, I think now is where the excitement starts for me. Uh, nothing against the next 90 performances that I've been doing on all of that. But I love storytelling. And I feel like that's what excites me the most, the, the possibility to, to go on a stage and be a prince or to tell the story of Romeo. Mm-hmm. And, and interact with my colleagues on stage and kind of surprise each other as well. Mm-hmm. And yeah. um, I feel like that's, that's a very unique experience. And I crave it all the time. Right now we are performing uh, Blake works to James Blake music. So that's kind of therapeutic. That's like when you put on some music in your room and you get to dance full out, mm-hmm. except that you are in an opera, beautiful opera house mm-hmm. and a huge stage. So I, I take that for that purpose, um, but as a storyteller, I really, I'm really looking forward to the last two story ballets. Yeah. What about you, Misa? I am, I think he said it all for, for me too, but um, currently we are performing the mixed program and then I'm doing Color Form by Miles Stetcher and um, I'm really enjoying that. Uh, because I get to watch everyone on stage and then I get to see that they're enjoying and then they're bringing so much energy to this piece and then that uh, feeds my uh, feeds me and then I get inspired and then I want to bring something more to the stage. So it's a huge um, collaboration and um, an amazing uh, way to work together on stage. So I'm really enjoying that. But yes, like, of course, he, um, like Isaac said, I am so looking forward to storytelling because that's my favorite things to do. Um, And uh, Cinderella is my story. So (laughs) I would love to be able to share that on stage with everyone in the opera house. 
Wonderful. Oh, wow. Well, thank you so much. Thank you so much for your time and for both of you sharing. I'm so ex personally so excited to see you both in Cinderella. I will be there and um, for the rest of the season. So thank you so much for, for all of your insights today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.